Hey, you, you want to see something really scary? What's your favorite scary movie? I'm going to scare the hell out of you. What was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. They're coming to get you, Barbara. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. What's blood for, if not for shedding? Welcome to Fright Night. Welcome back to Jump Scare. I'm Betty. And I'm Shed. Woo! This week, we're covering my birthday movies, Blood Gorge and Dark Harvest. Devil's Night. Six friends decide to take solace outside of Detroit for one evening. Devil's Night, let's go! <laughs> Happy Halloween, you fucking creeps! Little did they know they'd find themselves trapped in a nightmare they can't awake from. Oh, she hasn't responded to my messages. Where are the phones? What'd you say? The phones! Bro, there's a dead body in the trunk! The car is fucking dead! If this picture doesn't make you vomit, you have no soul. <laughs> Fuck! Blood Gorge. Pain is temporary. Halloween is forever. Now when I mean birthday movies, this was my birthday month. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Without the, like, uh, whatchamacallit, skewer... Coming into my throat. Oh, yeah. You're not going to get uh, shish kebabbed. No, no shish kebab. Well, I do like me a good... I do like to eat a good shish kebab. Just not the way they did in that movie. No. Definitely not that way. Um, that's just all stick, right? Like, no. I chose two films. <clears throat> they are both Halloween-esque in their own rights. One is a indie feature. And the other is a movie adaptation of a novel that Shad read. Yes, and I'm going to stick with the novel on this one. <laughs> wow, you just <laughs> went in like, boom, I'm just going to tell you right now I didn't like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll save that for after. Okay, yeah. Now, <clears throat> a long time ago, seems like a decade ago, but it hasn't been a decade yet, uh, we attended one of the popcorn frights. And there happened to be, like, a VHS vendor outside. Of course, you know, us being the connoisseurs we are of the old media, we had to go see what what this was about. And I was not disappointed, okay? Top-notch fucking collection. Got to talking um, to this individual, whose name is Victor, and... <clears throat> you know, found out in that conversation that he actually has, like, a store, a VHS store, like, in his home. Yeah, he's converted one of the rooms of the house <laughs> into a makeshift video store. And I was like, um, can we go over and look at this? And also, can we interview you? Because this is amazing. And this is a treasure, and everyone must know. It's actually on our YouTube channel. It's under House Haunters Presents. Because I had this, like, obsession, fascination of, like, finding, like, you never know, you know, what people have behind closed doors. There's, like, a crazy Netflix show that came out either, I think probably after um, we filmed, like, way after we filmed this, of, like, people go into people's homes and, like, they have the craziest shit in their house. Yeah. Not, like, hoarders or anything. Just, like, oh, this person happens to have, like, an amazing horror collection. Or this person lives under the sea and everything's fucking under the water in their house. Like, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> So I was like, okay, hello, definitely need to see this. And I was not disappointed, okay? I did not want to leave. I wanted to move in, okay? <laughs> um, which would have been weird. Um, and he would totally know that I was living there. But we actually have that on our YouTube channel. And everyone should go and watch this amazing area because... It's like one thing, like, oh, you live up north and you have a basement, you converted it, blah, 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 like you see in TikTok now. It's another thing to, like, live in a house, you know, and, like, convert, 
like a normal one level in Florida of all fucking places. I'm just trying to say like in Florida, you think, oh, you're going to find an amazing like VHS store in there. It's going to be in a garage or it's going to be in the shed out back. It's not going to be in the house. Or none. Maybe maybe I'm like fucking so close minded. Like I think this is like a place of like a fucking unicorn. Like I just stumbled upon a unicorn and there's no other place like this in Florida. Like no one has this. But I haven't been in everyone else's home. I was only in this home and this amazing VHS treasure trove. And the beauty was that he sold these VHSs. And um, I definitely purchased several of them. Several of them. I wanted to purchase all of them, but you know, I just had a baby at the time. I couldn't like get another job to support you know, your VHS habit. Support my habit. <laughs> now, <laughs> many years have passed by, and I, you know, Instagram, and I see that uh, he he's made a movie, and Victor has made a movie with his friends called Blood Gorge. And this is, I believe, the second film. And I was like, I need to see this film. Like, I need to see. I want to get all the info. And I'm going to tell you right now, because you just jumped in and said, eh, I, I stick to the book on our second film. Yeah. I fucking love this movie. Now, we are uh, Last Drive-In fans. And a while back, it feels like it was last year, maybe it was three years, I don't know. Maybe Joe Bob does a monologue about this every so often, as he should. But Joe Bob gave some great fucking advice. And he was like, pick up the camera, guys. You don't need to like go to like fancy film school. You want to do that? That's cool. Yes, yeah, your prerogative. But you don't need to do that. Get a weekend, get some friends together, pick the camera up, and just do that shit. Like, do it. Right? Best advice. Very heartfelt. Okay? I was teary-eyed. Because, of course, I love film. And I've always wanted to make a film. Like, someone who really is, like, the lover of film. That's, like, I I love all aspects of it. And, you know, here we are. But to see, like, that come true for someone else, I'm fucking elated. Because that is such fun. It's so, it's so much fun. And, you know, you come out the other end, whether you like it or you don't like it or people don't like it, who cares? You created something. You had nothing and you created something, you know? And who the fuck knows? 10, 20 years from now, with, this happens all the time with movies. The movie was fucking hated, okay? And then it's a fucking cult classic. Like, everyone yeah. fucking loves it. <clears throat> now, let me just start with... The look of the film is, like, very grainy. It's very 70s-esque, like, the look. It's not set in that time frame. It just has, like, a retro look to it, which I love. Um, I love those, like, yellow and oranges, you know, that, like, muted color, you know, 70s. And the opening is, whether that was the intention or not, to me... And anyone that has watched these movies knows, like, this is straight up Halloween 4 opening. Like, yeah. it is a classic Halloween 4 opening down to with elements of, like, Carpenter-esque with the shots of, like, the street and the barn and, you know, whatever mixed in with that classic Halloween 4 Halloween opening. Like, even though I feel like they should more show more stuff, this one actually, this opening satisfied me. I was like, yes, I'm fucking in it. This is Halloween. Like, this is yeah. the feel of Halloween. And I was immediately in love at that point. I, I was like, okay, I'm, I see what's, and I already knew because I, you know, seen the trailer, like what the villain was going to look like, you know, the slasher. And, um, I love, I love the look of the, the killer, you know, you gotta love the killer look. I feel you gotta have a good killer look. Yeah. I think that when you start to do a slasher movie, the first thing you've got to come up with is the look of the killer. And then go from there. Because if you don't have an interesting look on the killer, then why bother? If it's just a guy in a uh, camouflage baseball cap chasing you around with a machete, it's like, well, that's just a regular day here in Florida. We don't get that every day. (laughs) So that's not really going to be anything all that shocking to anybody here in Florida, Texas, or any of the states where that's common. So, you know, you got to find something unique. You know, you've got to have it. You know, clown masks have been kind of done to death. So you got to find something that'll catch your eye and stay in your mind more than just, you know, a plain-faced guy running around doing all this stuff. Yeah, agreed. 
I do want to preface that I may or may not cough horrendously during this podcast. I'm holding back um, cough coughs in general okay. um, because I had to peel myself off of bed to watch the film slash do this podcast, but I had to fucking do it, okay? I was super motivated. I was like, I got to get this done um, and out here before the month is out um, because we have had three episodes this month, right? Two, two episodes. It feels like oh, it's because we we covered, we're doing two. So two movies, yeah. I'm like, it's three. Um, the director of photography, wonderful. Um, the special effects, uh, round of applause. I'm gonna actually clap in a circle. <laughs> Next okay. round of applause. Yes. Um, to Kate, um, who did a wonderful job. Um, this was written and directed by uh, Victor Gabriel, um, Blood Gorge. Um, it's set on Devil's Night. Um, it's the night before Halloween. And, you know, uh, there's right off the bat, like, title card. But I, look, see some title cards. Like, last year, I did not want to see Evil Dead Rise. I was like, oh, I'm done with these evil fucking dead movies. That fucking title card, boom. Like, that. that's like the whole fucking movie right there. I feel like I got a good title card. Fantastic. Um, love the title card on this. And <clears throat> I feel like I need to like pick every single thing. I could talk about the movie for a long time. Even though I would j- also want to say it is 40 minutes long. It is a feature considered to be... According to the Academy, uh, to the Oscar people, 40 minutes or more is a feature-length film. So this technically counts. It is not... You know, I feel fulfilled. Um, there was no bullshit. The dialogue... I'm like... First of all, these are all actual friends. It's one of those where, like, the names of the people in the movie are the real names. Um, yeah. So, they all know each other. They're actual friends. It was filmed in four days. You know? Um, fantastic. Editing. Pretty good. Um, the music. <sighs> like, I don't know how long it took. Uh, Victor's a music guy. I don't know how long it took him to, like, get the music, compile that, who chose the music, like, what, you know, who's going to do what. Like, where is it music going to fall in the scenes and whatnot? But it kept the movie going. Um, I was jamming to it. I was like, ooh, what's that? Ooh, you know. When you're, like, on YouTube and you have a YouTube channel, there's, like, a basic, like, sounds, like, music. You know, the generic yeah. ones. Um, when you're making a film, they have the same generic, like, um, things. So I, I really enjoy the choices there. Um, <laughs> there is a video store that this is actually filmed in. The actual videos are video exclusive. Yeah. Um, Those are rare nowadays. <clears throat> super rare. And unbeknownst to me, because I motherfucking didn't know, that this, this store had like a section. Now, yes, obviously there's pornos and these kind of stores. But not like dildos. I was not expecting a dildo to be sold. It actually got confirmation they actually do sell dildos. Wow. Um, it's one-stop shopping. It is one-stop shopping. I feel... But, like, I need to be a fly in a fucking wall. Like, the person comes in. They're like, you know what? I feel like watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Whichever version, whatever. I'm not going to... And then they're like, you know what? But I got to get my rocks off. So I'm also going to choose this thing. Oh, man. My dildo. It's in the shop. It's in the shop. Got I gotta get a new dildo. Or I left it in so and so's place. Gotta get a new dildo. And then this is what you're coming to the counter with. Raisinets dildo. And not like a regular dildo. This is like a fucking eight incher. Like eight inch dildo. It's like multicolored, whatever. Yeah. Raisinets. The Texas porno. Chainsaw Massacre and Texas porn. Chainsaw Massacre. I feel like you end up on a very special watch list from the government <laughs> when you buy all those things at the same time. It's like you can't subscribe to the Cartoon Network and the Porno Channel on the same night. You make a couple of very interesting watch lists when you do that, too. If there's a Dom section, is there, like... Then you go with, with a rope. Yeah. You're like, mm, I don't know. There's a button. There's, like, doot, doot. You know, the button at the counter they press, like in the <laughs> Simpsons when they had the independent thought alarm, when the children thought independently at the school, they pressed the button. Remove the colored chalk, Willie. The children are overstimulated. Oh, my God. Now... <clears throat> The killer, you know, right off the bat kills his first victim. And I'm not getting into it. It it um you know, the one question I didn't ask is like when is it coming out? They've been posting here and there, like I think there's at least some distribution. Um, Victor 
after you hear this, if you do hear the podcast, you can just fucking DM me after and be like, you ruined the whole thing. This is this is not any information. This is all bad. Do it again. And then I'll just do another podcast with updated info. Um, but I'm sure y'all will be able to see this film one day. And it should be seen by all. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I... Um, what? The kills... Gory as fuck, man. Like, great. Great, great indie kills. But, like, high indie. Not like <clears throat> you see, like, I don't know, the terrible shit we've seen over the years. Yeah, you've all seen the stuff where they just, <clears throat> it's very clearly, like, CGI blood that someone put on from a pattern where it's the same blood over and over again. It's Not even that. I'm just saying, like, old school, like... Terrible kills on there. This is more along the lines of, like, if you like the stuff that they do with the Terrifier, you'll like this. Oh, yes. There's a lot of gruesome things that happen in this that remind me of stuff that happens, like, in the Terrifier. Not necessarily that they're copying kills or anything like that, but just the level of gore that goes on is, I'd say it's, like, original Terrifier-esque. Yeah, and it looks pretty good. There's, the DP did, has amazing shots. Like, vivid, like, stands out. Um, at the beginning when the killer is like face to face with the victim, but it's only half his face. Yeah, that was good. And it's like, you know, hand in, like zoomed into them. Like, I, I love just the look of that, that frame. And then the other frame, which I thought was hilarious. And is uh, when there's someone's getting their intestines ripped out and there's, you know, the friends are coming up. And they see the friend, like, leaning up against a tree. And then he has this, like, <laughs> intestines on the killer's holding it at the other end. Yeah. So it's like they're playing tug-of-war <laughs> with it. And then they both look at the camera, which, you know, it would, obviously it's us, the audience. But it's really the friends. Um, I just like the way that that looked. Um, there's a lot of frames in the film that I actually enjoyed. <clears throat> um but I do have a question now that I'm not going through the whole film, like, in my mind. The scene, I, maybe I missed that. Maybe I was, like, going the coughing fit um, that I was having. The scene where Kate um, is burning a sh piece of paper in the woods. Like, what the hell was that about? I missed that. I need to go back and either rewatch that or just ask Victor, like, what the heck was going on there? Because I totally missed that. I think, like, the reason why that stands out is because I was like, was there some brujeria involved? Like, oh, what the fuck was going on with that? Was that, like, a love letter she was trying to, like, give somebody and that we just, did I miss that? I'm just, I don't know. Because I feel like it made it a point to, like, show her do that, you know? So there had to be some kind of significance to it. Um, but, yeah, it's one of those, like, you know... I, I don't want to give it away because it is new, so I'm not going to say who the killer is, but I did like the look of the killer, 100%. There's something about, like, I don't know, like, Valentine or, like, uh, freaky, you know, like, a smiling, not a clown, just maybe, like... A smiling, happy face coming at you with yeah. a machete or an axe or whatever. Like, if it was, like, the, the fucking kid from, like, Fallout, if there was just a mask of that and, like, the killer's just waving at me, you know, slowly just looking from afar, like, I'm shitting my fucking pants. Yeah. Like, that's horrifying to me. Because it's so maniacal. Like, it's the extremes. Like, you have, like, the Michael Myers face, which is, like, fucking blank face to like grin face but like in that like 50s-esque yeah you know kind of style creepy as hell creepy now you know the things that creep me out so don't send me any creepy shit that looks like that because i don't want to see creepy it shit. <laughs> but did you have a favorite i've hogged this whole thing about this film uh did you have a favorite moment in the film um I think probably the kill in the video store, which we're not going to say what it is, but there's a kill that happens in the video store that is uh, something you don't see every day. So I was uh, laughing at that one because I'm like, well, that's not what I was expecting. So yeah, that one was a fun one. Oh, yeah. I believe there's three jump scares. Yeah. And there was uh, that one was a good one, too. So yeah, I like that one. Be on the lookout for that when it comes out. 
So my rating is, um, I always forget the highest level of our rating. Okay, yeah, because normally someone would say it's like five, but ours is four. I give it a 3.5. <laughs> All right. Do we do points? Three, three, three knives. I want to concur. It's a three and a half knifer. Even all the years we've been doing this, I almost fucking said stars. You know that, right? You know, yes, almost said stars. Okay. I know. Okay. I'm so sorry, guys. One day, I'm going to get it together with our rating. One day. Now, um, thank you, Victor, and for allowing us to view the film and review it and had the opportunity. We were very grateful. Um, and everyone involved, they all did an excellent job. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, I get it. Because, you know, Halloween... Now we go into 2023's Dark Harvest. It's Halloween. Let me out, please! You know what that means. Let me out! Ah! Old Sawtooth Jack is gonna rise from the cornfields. It's gotta be stopped. Kill or be killed. You've all heard the stories. We failed at our duties. And that black dust destroyed our crops, our lives. It must die so we can live. Your sacred duty is to take down Sawtooth Jack before that church bell rings at midnight. You really think that's real? I saw it. It's real. You saw it? Did you kill it? Then let's go kill it. You should do it. You know I'm not allowed. Just because your brother won the run last year? I got an idea. If that thing isn't dead by midnight, this whole town is going straight to hell! I want to go home. I want to go home. You think you're special. Why are you doing this? If you're born in this town, you're cursed. I'm ending this. Tonight. It ain't over. This fucking movie. This fucking movie. Yeah, let me tell you right now. The book, which came out in 2006, <clears throat> is written by a writer named Norman Partridge. He won the Bram Stoker Award. It's, it's a novella, really. It's like a longer short story. I think it's like 180-something pages. It's not incredibly long. Because it basically takes place in the one night. And you find out that there's a town where they have this hunt every year. They have what they... The, it's either the... I call, some people call it the October Boy. Some people call him Sawtooth Jack. He comes out of the cornfield. And if he makes it into the church before midnight and rings the bell then he will the town will suffer everything will go bad the town may just be wiped out everybody may die so every year to celebrate this make sure they stop him the ritual is for the five days before halloween no one they lock up all the teenage boys in their rooms they don't get to eat they don't get to drink except just enough to keep them alive and then on Halloween night, when it gets dark, they turn him out. And they have to try and find Sawtooth Jack and kill him before he makes it to the, to the church. Whoever is the one that finds him and kills him, their family is set up. They get a brand new house. They get a brand new car. The one that does it gets to go represent the town and sent out to be like the town ambassador for the Harvester's Guild. And strangely enough, the person who wins never seems to come back to the town. No one ever sees them again, and no one ever thinks anything about that, because, hey, they left the small town, and they're out living a glorious life in the big cities now. You see where this is going. Yeah, the... Whoever wins and kills Sawtooth Jack is sacrificed and becomes Sawtooth Jack next year. Because they bury them out in the cornfield, and they're the one that rises up next year to start the shit all over again. So... It's a great story. It's very atmospheric and very creepy. It remi- the story reminds me a lot of like Ray Bradbury mixed with a little bit of uh, like John Carpenter-ish, like 
the way they describe things in the book reminds, like I said, look, it's Ray Bradbury was being adapted by John Carpenter, is how the book reads to me. And I love the book, it's great. And then when I heard they were going to make a movie, I was just like, okay, this could be good. The guy who did David Slade, that directed 30 Days a Night and one of the Twilight movies, maybe more than one, I don't know. But he was going to do it, so I'm like, okay, he might do a good job at that. And, you know, I will say this for it. The effects are great. They have amazingly gruesome kills in this. The monster itself is like, pretty sure whoever, like Norman Partridge, I think he watched Pumpkinhead and was like, what if that was literal? What if he literally had a pumpkin for a head? That's where the monster comes from. I love seeing the creepy monster walking through the town. The Like I said, the kills are great. It's It has that, like, you know, Halloween 4 opening like you were talking about. It has that creepy feeling of small town America with everybody getting ready for Halloween. But this time, Halloween is not like a happy holiday here because, you know, people are going to die hunting Sawtooth Jack. Somebody's going to have to... You know, kids die every year, they talk about. It's like Lord of the Flies meets The Purge. Yeah. Um, You know, Lord of the Flies meets The Purge. This is what this movie... With Halloween. On Halloween yeah. night. This is what this movie is. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, the people in the town, like the butcher, standing outside with a shotgun to make sure no one breaks in. Yeah. Because no one's eaten for days. So he's like, oh, you're not breaking in and stealing my food and getting an unfair advantage by being, you know, well fed. So he's standing out there with a shotgun. Oh, I meant novella. I'm sorry. We're not. We haven't gone to the film yet. Yeah, novella. Well, either one. You know. Yeah. Either one is still like the thing, but what the movie does right, the movie gets the, like the look of the the town right, the creepiness, the small town atmosphere, the the look. The book it was, as far as I remember, was kind of ambiguous as to when it was set. Uh, now that's where I'm going to jump in. Okay. So I had never read the book. I remember vaguely you telling me about this. Um, that you're reading this and what was happening in the book. Um, as someone that's coming in with, I know the basics. Everything you just said, I knew. With the exception of time frame, which you said that it was never established, which I think is a smart thing for a novelist that's doing, one, you already have a theme that's around on Halloween night. <clears throat> when you add high tech, that can create issues with the audience because everyone's yelling like what the hell just get your iPhone out or just get the Android out the way out. the story was this. written the phones and stuff really didn't come up so it could have been yeah it's ambiguous it's like it follows like she got a seashell fucking book reader, yeah. book reader slash like that was also like her like beeper or whatever it, it was fucking weird it's like well, what is this yeah. what is this Okay, because I, I looked extensively online yeah. and I could not find a seashell. Yeah, the story came out in 2006 <laughs> and it could have been set in 2006. It could have been set in 1966 yeah. because the story just read uh, kind of, you know, it was a general uh, story. You didn't get like a lot of, they didn't get into like what kind of cars people were driving, yeah. that kind of thing. The movie decides to do a lot of things. Okay, the movie decides, and this is where it irks me because saw the whole thing, right? the ending, like, oh, okay, well, we'll won't get in too far deep into what happened there. But I will say that besides being greatly disappointed, it's like my Fear Street slash The Craft rant. Why? Why did you bother either doing a revisioning or a remaking or just an adaption of something that people love? They got awards. People love that shit for this novel, like the novella. Like, people were love the craft. Cult following, okay? Fear Street. I mean, hello. So many books to choose from. So It wasn't like Fear Street, the series, only had two books. There was a shit ton of those, okay? And then side books of yeah. the Fear Street thing. So there's plenty to go off of. And you, you, you're like, oh, shit. That's hot. That's popular. You know, let's. This, it was successful in these areas. Let's bring that. And then you're like, nah, whatever. We're just gonna totally redo it. We're just gonna rewrite. You know, start from scratch. We just took the name and you know, and maybe some elements here or there. But we're just totally gonna fucking redo it. And it's like, why did you bother doing that? Because that's not what people want to see. People yeah. don't want to see that shit. They love it for a reason, and, and movie... you're totally spinning it on its head and trying to make it something else. 
the whole thing of it setting in the 50s or whatever? 1962. Fine. Whatever. 1962? Okay. Like, middle America, totally, I, I, we're in a cornfield. I get it. 1962, we're there. Now, I was this, fine with them changing, but the, you know, setting it in the past. That's I fine. was fine. The thing I wasn't <laughs> fine about being in the past is they made a, in the novel, there's everyone is one ethnicity, right? Then they decide in the movie, let's make her a black girl, but let's make her a black girl, but completely not stay tuned to like what the temp was in 1962. This black girl, who by the way is the only black person in this town, because there's no there's no other black people. There's no, no. I never. I don't see any black kids in the town. Just her. She's the only black person in this town, okay? Maybe her aunt or uncle, they live there somewhere. We never see them. She's the, she's a teenager. She got a job. She's taking the money out of all the other people in the town in the movie theater. No, I'm telling you what. She didn't have a job. In 1962, maybe it wasn't there, but from what I have read they in history... They really deal with the whole fact that she's the lone black person in the town in the midwest they really just kind of there's a couple of lines where people say something racist to her there are some racist lines but it's like just because they're like oh we can't have this character in this time frame and no one's racist but they never really explain like how or why she's there well they do but it, it doesn't make a lot of sense with the rest of the it doesn't town. they do in the and, novel because she's not ethnic or whatever yeah. she's whatever but there is a reason why she's there because you can't leave this town this is a town where you can't fucking leave. There's no, like, crazy... This is not, like, uh, the under the dome or whatever, where you, like, physically literally can't leave. But the cop who is, like, this cop, I hope that he was getting paid. The sheriff was getting paid a lot of money. Because, man, that motherfucker is, like, he got spider senses. How he knew between him and, I guess, the farmer who probably lived, like, right there. He probably had a house right there in the edge of fucking town. The farmer guy who was helping the whole time. Um, because every time someone's trying to leave town, boom, they were there. Yeah. Boom. Like, he not even out getting a donut with coffee. Like, boom, he had this place. He, he, that was his only job, I guess, because he was always monitoring that fucking, the, the, the county line, the county line, right? So we have, you know, the winner of the town, the first roundabout, he goes and he drives off in this like fucking fancy ass, like 19 Corvette or whatever. And fade out then we see present day like whatever a year later and the brother who uh was left behind he's you know they were the winners they were the victors of the the guy you know jim he won so his family was well off they had a nice ass house they moved from you know run down fucking house and the fucking bad on the, uh, the opposite side of the tracks yeah. to like where all the fancy rich people live and they're living really fancy rich lives and um, their son is supposedly traveling, you know, around yeah. the the United States. He's but in California. They're very sad and depressed, so you figure out pretty quick. Yeah, he's not traveling. Yeah, he did. Like he did, and he he the pumpkin man. Like this is just zoom it up. Like it, but it, this was another thing with the book with the movie was that they combined several characters from the book into you know they combined characters, they altered things like. The, the main character in the book didn't have family members that had won the, the contest the mm. year before. There was a lot of things that they just combined just for ease of, oh, okay, he's going to do this. We're just going to you know combine characters. And that would have been okay, but it, it really didn't have... His motivation to do it in the book was he was forced to. He was forced to go out there and do this. He didn't want to. And they changed all that for the movie where, oh, I want to do it. I want to prove that I'm as good as my brother. Which changes the whole tone of the story, really, you know? Yeah. I, I Let me tell you, as someone that has read many novels that do get adapted into film and then come away with fucking being aggravated and, like, high annoyance, I was just... I knew what was going to happen. And I was motherfucking annoyed. I can't even imagine being someone that had all this knowledge beforehand and it's like, if you just wanted the idea, I guess they could have just stole a change people's names and just fucking gone about their life. Like, yeah. they didn't have to, like, buy. But at the same time, for an author, like, they're offering you whatever they're offering you. 
You you know, you're not and fucking you Susan me. Collins. Like, you're not fucking uh, J.K. Rowling. Like, you're going to take the fucking money. Like, you, you're going to get paid. And you do, yeah. just do whatever your story. It could be the John Carpenter thing. He's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> Joe Schmo, uh, shitbag, made of my, remade my movie. I don't care about that. I got the check in the mail. Like, I I made my movie. My movie's the only one that matters, yeah. so to speak. You know, I, I'm, I got paid. So, it's one of those where it's just like, okay, well, I guess. Um, also, did the pumpkin... I'm going to call him Pumpkin Man. Saw Jack. Sawtooth Jack. Sawtooth Jack, which, why? Oh, because he, he, he got yeah. a jagged tooth and we made him carve a jack-o'-lantern. Yeah, sawed his teeth out. Okay. <clears throat> Sawtooth Jack. Did he, uh, was he a pyromaniac? Did he have fucking telekinetic, uh, he was a carry? Like, what uh, the hell? He did burn some things in the book. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Did he have a pitchfork? He just shot out his head? I, I was just very curious because it was like he got mad. It was like he became like the Hulk, like pumpkin style, and then his like fucking pumpkin head was flaming, and then he was just like... Yeah, they had that some flourishes for the movie there, but yeah, he did have like things in the book where he would remember who he was, like he went through his house and everything, and like saw like his old house and his old room, and you realize, okay, he does have some memories of who he was. Yeah, the brother is in a gang, and you Uh, know... That's an addition for the movie also. Oh, good. Yeah, of course it is. The 50s gang, I mean... Shake my head because uh, this was the saddest gang I've ever seen in my life. Now I get it, like the fifties, you wear the leather jackets, you got the switchblades, you're combing your hair, you're fucking slicking your hair back, whatever, blah blah. blah. You're wearing your fucking little muscle tees with the cigarettes rolled in. I get it, but you don't really actually do anything because this guy got his ass beat by one dude. I thought when the two football players. Who were not the? They were football players of the fifties. Okay, so a normal dude. These are not yeah. jacked up, like crazy ass eight pack fucking guys that are like eight feet tall fucking coming in. These are just regular Joe Schmell. Beat the shit out. I thought it was gonna be like a because usually when you're in a gang or you have friends, you know everyone jumps the guy, right? They just don't fight one on one. Yeah, you know because people are pussies. No, this guy was like, no, I'm taking, I'm taking this, I'm taking this guy, and he did, and he got a beat down. Um, and I was all about it because I was like, you're, you're wearing a gang jacket and you can't even fight. You better take that fucking jacket off. Yeah. Take it off, hang it out in the closet and go back to where and you're just regular, just wear your fucking Letterman sweater and just yeah, wear fucking... your Letterman sweater and be done with it. Or just wear a regular sweater and don't even try to be cool. Yeah. Your Argyle sweater, like just chillax, fold down the jeans, you know, Stop smoking cigarettes. Stop swiping the smokes from the store like you're a badass. You're a nobody. You're a shitbird. Sit down, okay? No one cares about you. I was really annoyed by his character, by the way. And they, uh, (laughs) among other things that they changed was the ending. The, they decided to... Oh, we were going to get to that, yeah. We were going to... Give this, um, like, a terrible ending instead of the amazing ending that was in the book. They decided, you know what? We need to make this a downbeat ending, and we need to make one of the characters do something so horrifically stupid that people will just shake their head at it for years and go, but but why? But why? I, not even going to get into it, but yeah, it was a terribly written ending. I don't know why they did it that way. The ending of the book was just <coughs> fine, but they chose to put their own ending on it and <clears throat> make it worse. Now... You really went into the ending of the film, but we totally forgot to do roll call, okay? So there's three recognizable people in this film, okay? One, I'm going to start off with my crush, which you didn't know because I didn't, I didn't express that in the movie um, when we were watching it. Luke Kirby, who is the sheriff, he played Lenny Bruce in Marvelous uh, Mrs. Mrs. Maisel. And I... Yes, I could love horror movies and also love other things. And I did really enjoy that show. Um, then you have... And this this is like someone that you have seen many times, which is Elizabeth Reiser, who was in The Haunting of Hill House. She was in The Ouija Origin of Evil. Um, she's been a... Uh, she was... She was... Hello. She was the mom in The Twilight Saga, the mom of the vampires. So she... she you know, recognizable face. I mean, and you have um, Jeremy Davis was, Davies was the uh, father of the two boys. And 
<clears throat> um, he was in Justified and Twister and The Secretary. He's been in a lot of things. Um, yeah, he was the boyfriend in The Secretary. The, this is the movie with James Spader and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. He was the um, the boyfriend. Um, and then you have the all the young cast, um, you know, rising stars. So because it cut you off and I kind of went back to the cast, you were starting to say the ending of the film, um, which you didn't like. Yeah, they completely changed it from the book. The book has, I would say, a hopeful ending. The movie does not. The movie makes a lot of, the characters make a lot of mistakes that you just shake your head at and are like, I can't believe anybody would do that. That is the worst decision I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, even in a horror movie, you expect people to do somewhat dumb things, but these were just over-the-top dumb and not even believable. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really say whether this was going to be a spoiler cast or not. I mean, the movie did come out in early October, so it, it is esque new, um, now available on Prime. <laughs> um, so that's where you can view the film we didn't say that right off the bat um, so I don't know I feel like I want to discuss the ending of the film and what the hell happens but but we won't so I give this film uh, I, I don't even know I don't give it a rating I, I, I really it was okay it was fine it I feel like it could have been much more. It, the pacing was kind of off. And there was just things that these characters did that were so fucking stupid. And then knowing what direction the characters were going. Like, the like okay, like the kids' moms. Like Jim and the brother. Forgot the fucking brother's name. Um, Richie. Richie. Jim and Richie. They had a mom and a dad. In the novel, they didn't have a mom. Yeah, she had died in an accident the year before. So they have the mom, and she's just there to provide a slight releva uh, relevation. Not really. Um, and then she just fucking offs herself. And it's like, okay, well, in the novel, she never existed to begin with. And literally, you just kept her on. You know, I love Elizabeth Reiser, don't get me wrong, but... Then you're going to just have her just take herself out, like, in a such cowardly-ass way. And I get it, blah, 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 she lost her kid, and it's sad, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, like, I feel like you didn't do enough to keep the kid that didn't need to be involved. Because he, like, he pulled the fucking Hunger Games, and he was like, oh, you know. I volunteer I volunteer as tribute. tribute kind of shit. Yeah. You know, for no reason. And then the ending just fucks all that up, and it's just, ugh. That whole thing. So that's why I'm just like... But I did like the look of the pumpkin once they showed it up close. Um, I do like... I did like what you had said that the description of it was that you can kind of see the person underneath the yeah, pumpkin. See a little bit there. You know, like their face underneath the pumpkin. Yeah. So the makeup was the excellent. End, we did get to see a little bit of a... There's yeah. A little bit of their face coming through at the end. You know, like I said, I'll give it points for, like, it looks good. The film looks good. The, like, the kills in it are great. There's some great gory effects. There are. There's one that just, it's very, it was, which you said was not even in a novel, but it's like, okay, but I can accept that because it's such a good scene. Yeah. Um, But there's, like, a blood gush yeah, scene. Yeah, it's a great one. There's a lot of good stuff. If they had, I could have even dealt with them combining some of the characters if they had just handled the ending differently. Yeah. If they'd handled the ending differently, I would have forgiven the other things. But when you when you you know when you don't stick the landing, I can't forgive anything else. And then you make these characters so fucking cowardly and just fucking downright dumb as fuck. Like all of a sudden they became the stupidest fucking people on earth and everything that all the character like the certain characters were trying to accomplish they totally didn't accomplish and it's just like but that was your whole motivation to do all this to begin with and then you're not gonna go follow through like what the fuck dude i don't know i just it was very annoying yeah. um i give it one knife yeah i'll give it one knife too just for the uh the look of it and the kills that's it but the rest of it i can't get behind it no no but you know what i am glad that i saw 
Blood Gorge first. Because at least I went in in a good mood. Yeah. If you'd seen uh, Dark Harvest first, you'd have been in a dark mood when you went into it. I would have. I would have. But I feel like Blood Gorge would have definitely lifted, uplifted my spirit. Um, Man. You see? And it's like, even in that, like, that's how you do a movie. Like, okay, it's an indie movie. And it's 40 minutes. And, you know, it's it's like, oh, I'm going to just do that in, like, four days. Way better than this fucking movie that probably took three months to fucking make. And it had a bajillion people in it. Like, they could have done this as part of an anthology movie where it was, like, a 30 to 40 minute segment. And it would have been perfect. Yeah. Yeah, they could have done. They could have done this that. This was like forty-five minutes <laughs> and part of like a you know Tales from the Crypt kind of thing, where you're gonna do the movie and you're gonna have like three long segments. This would have been a perfect like Tales from the Crypt or Tales from the Dark Side kind of thing, you know? Yeah, or maybe like set it in like, I don't know, not the Wild West, but like maybe Pioneer times. I don't know, maybe a little earlier than because I, I I see where. I understand where it gets problematic when you're like, first of all, do we need another? I mean, hey, I love the 80s, but 80s, 90s, like, there's already there's tech already, so we can't... It, so in the 1930s would have been, like, during the Depression where the town's doing well. Yeah, and okay. And like, that, that's why the town is doing so well when everyone else is having a rough time because Yeah, it's of middle this. America. We don't really need to deal with, like, all the stuff that's happening in, like, other places. Like, yeah. we just need to keep it just focused on, like, oh... We're all just trying hard to get by and we're all suffering kind of thing, you know, and this is what we had to do. And and I know this was a thing in the novel, too. They never really explain, like, what the fuck it is. Like, Yeah, they don't really get much into it. They don't really tell you exactly what's going on, which I was fine with because they got just enough details that you knew what was happening. You figure somewhere along the line, the Harvester's Guild made this deal with something. Now, this is where there's a tie-in. Now, hear me. Hear me out. Hear me out. Because we were about to, we were just about to pack our bags and close up the whole podcast and just stay tuned to the horror and buy, right? Yeah. But what if? Where did they ever see where this uh, cornfield was? I don't know exactly. That's I don't fine. Even if exactly they didn't, from the book. Even if they didn't, or they did. Do you think this could be he who <laughs> walks behind the world? Uh, uh, no. Is it? Is it the? Isn't another like cornfield craziness where it's just like an evil fucking entity that's in the fucking cornfield? You know? Yeah, I think there, I think there's multiple ones of those. Yeah, I don't know. Every I just, cornfield throughout the Midwest is just harboring some kind of evil. There's mole people. There's he who walks behind the rose. There's sawtooth Jack. There's the seed people. There's always going to be some kind of monster in the cornfield. There's that cornfield from the the Stephen King, Joe Hill story that they did in the tall grass where they went into like the cornfield, oh, yeah. tall grass kind of thing. Yeah, there's always some kind of, that was like a like ancient ruin that was unearthed in there that caused all that. Anytime there's a cornfield, just stay the fuck out of it, okay? Boom. Um, Jason, uh, Friday the 13th. The uh, Freddy vs. Jason. Yes, They're Freddy vs. Jason. They were in the cornfield. They were in the cornfield. Uh, the movie we... No, that was, I'm sorry. That was Sunflowers and Arctic, that one we covered long time ago. Yeah, it was Sunflowers. Yeah, but, sunflowers. Um, you know, when you want, like, good crops, it's hard to, like, get the good... I mean, who's really buying, like, um, whatchamacallit, Farmer's Almanac anymore? Like, I, you know, I, I used to. Well, that's what the internet's for. That I mean, it's just good to have something tangible in your hands, but fine. But, like... Man, they gotta, you gotta yeah, stay out of the cornfields, you know, because you just you don't know what the fuck is in there, dude. But I will leave you with that thought: stay out of the cornfields. That advice. And thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Jump Scare the Horror Podcast. Stay tuned to the horror. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.